This is The Fit Mess with Zach and Jeremy. All right, he's Zach and I'm Jeremy, and this is The Fit Mess. Thanks so much for downloading the show and being here with us uh, for this episode. We have a a great guest for you this week. Her name is Jennifer Tyler Lee. She's the author of a new cookbook that uh, I've been having some fun with at home. It's called Half the Sugar, All the Love, 100 Easy Low Sugar Recipes for Every Meal of the Day. We'll get into that in just a little bit, but uh, you know, speaking of food and diet, uh, that is something that I've, I've sort of been trying to take on um, to get under control a little bit this year. I, I really kind of went off the rails during the holiday season, trying to uh, make some changes and, and get things back uh, dialed in for the new year, and, and really to sort of answer the call, Zach, from your challenge on the last episode, to uh, really come up with a, a, a life resolution, something that I wanted to take with me to the grave and that is uh, really trying to clean up my relationship with food. Mm, that is a good resolution. How are you doing with that? Oh, it's you got a, it all it, nailed it's, down? It's a shit show. It's a mess. <laughs> it's a complete shit show. Um, just for a little background, uh, thanks to some guidance and advice from Zach a couple of years ago, I, I started doing the keto diet, but as a vegetarian, uh, that was challenging. However, I found a way to make it work, lost a bunch of weight, got really healthy, all that stuff. And starting this year, my wife and I, several times in the last many years, we would do, uh, we would take part in the, what do they call it? The Veganuary Challenge, where you basically go vegan for the month of January or as long as you can hold out. Uh, I have not gone all in, but I've been sort of trying to phase in a more vegan lifestyle or vegan diet, I guess, with my sort of keto uh, senses. The two worlds do not play well together. I'm just going to put it that way. It's it's not an easy task to marry a 100% plant-based diet with a high-protein, high-fat, low-carb diet. Yeah, I imagine the uh, the 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 meat factor on vegan is just is not not good, right? Yeah, meat is frowned upon if you're eating a vegan a vegan diet, but uh, yeah. yeah. That's I figured that would be, you know, what people were not gathering. It's not obvious, but no meat on a vegan diet. Right. Yeah. No yeah. meat, no meat sense. products like no eggs, no dairy, no butter, no ghee. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that, that I'm I'm struggling to let so go what do you of. Eat? What you do I eat? eat ice? Uh, I haven't eaten yeah. in 17 days. <laughs> <laughs> There is uh, nothing else, is there? Th- there's not much left. When you, when you cut out uh, all the animal products, it's basically lettuce is is what's left. Um, but it's it's been a struggle. But I've I bust I've dusted out some uh, some cookbooks that have some recipes. Um, I'm I'm having to be a little more creative with uh, like pasta dishes, for example. The other night I made a, a delicious uh, roasted red pepper. Uh, uh, pasta, and I used a, a really high protein. Um, I forget what the, I think the noodles are are made of lentils or something. So it's not like a really carby noodle, but there's carbs in there because mm-hmm. it's a noodle. Um, so I'm just trying to find ways to incorporate that. So if I'm going to eat a pasta dish, it's going to be high in protein and not a super heavy carb thing. Um, just mm-hmm. trying to trying to find ways to to do a little switcheroo. But I also you know I've gone vegan before and I fall into the trap of okay, take all the normal foods that most people in America eat, buy the vegetarian version of them uh, and eat that. So, you know, a lot of fake burgers, fake hot dogs, fake pizza, fake, like, you know, all the the alternative products, which are heavily processed, which I also don't want to put too much of in my body. So that's been, it's been very challenging because I haven't taken the time to sit down and go, okay, this is what I'm going to eat. These are the foods that I'm allowed to eat, eating this way. I sort of wait until I get hungry. And then I go try and figure something out. And then I panic, figure out there's nothing I can eat quickly, get really hungry, cave, eat whatever's in front of me, and then realize, oh, I should come up with a plan. And then I go back to whatever I was doing. And that cycle has been kind of repeating itself for the last couple of weeks. Yeah, that that doesn't sound uh, incredibly sustainable. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, you know, it could work. I mean, I'm not not going to poo-poo on it. I think it, you know. It's an interesting plan, for sure. (laughs) But the hard part is like so many, you know, I see all these uh, different advice things where it's like, oh, these are the foods you can eat. And it has a lot of quinoa and a lot of different grains um, because you're making a lot of, you know, kind of noodle or or rice-based dishes and and things like that. 
But then, you know, the keto brain in me is like, oh, don't eat that. That's garbage. That's that's going to mm-hmm. hurt. Don't put that in your body. So there's just this constant mental tug of war happening where where I don't I don't know which side to follow. It's so frustrating. So how do you, I mean, are you trying, are you eating full keto or are you just eating low carb? On this plan so far, which I use the plan, word plan very loosely, um, uh, low carb is, is sort of the okay. goal. That's, that's the goal because realistically day to day, I don't, I don't have the time to prepare the kind of food that it would take to prepare to do a full vegan keto diet. Is there even such a thing? Can you get that much protein out of a vegan diet? I have a, a cookbook called Vegan Keto that has tons of recipes that are both vegan and keto, but it's just, it's the amount of time that it takes to prep them. So, I mean, there's plenty of protein, there's plenty of all the nutrients and everything that you would need, but it's a lot of cooking, it's a lot of prep, it's a lot of chopping vegetables and all, all these things. And I just don't have time for that. So, right. you know, when, when I was able to go, gosh, I'm starving, I didn't, you know, pack well for lunch today. I could go home before and throw three or four eggs on a frying pan and boom, there's dinner. I'm good. Don't have to think about it. Uh, but mm-hmm. now every meal I have to think what's going into this, what's what's in this and what am I hoping this does for my body? So <clears throat> are you doing any kind of meal planning at all or is it just kind of all game time decisions? It's been largely game time decisions, but we had a, a big threat of a massive snowstorm here in Seattle and it did snow. Um, but prior to that, I went to Costco and loaded up for the, just in case we can't get out of our driveway for a week, here's all the stuff we're going to need. <laughs> so I kept in mind what my goal was, but I didn't think through full meals. It was more like, what can, what can I eat that the kids will eat that my wife will eat? That's not going to take a ton of time. So mm-hmm. I've had some options, but it's a lot of stuff that could be thrown together quickly um, there's been a couple days when I had some downtime because I was home with the kids or whatever, so I could spend some time in the kitchen and actually make a meal. Um, and so that, those have been, those have worked out fine. When I have the time, I can, I can make a meal that fits what I'm trying to do, but time is not a resource I have uh, in abundance with two kids and a full-time job and dogs and life. That makes total sense. But so my, my big question here is that even though you've gone vegan, sugar is not an animal product, is it? <laughs> no. But here's the thing. So now, as I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to eat, I'm also trying to figure out what can I make that my wife is going to eat because I don't want to make multiple meals. And a more difficult challenge, what are my kids going to eat? Because they don't eat anything. Like if it's not mac and cheese uh, with sprint, with you know sugar sprinkled on top, they're not eating <laughs> I cannot get these kids to eat. My, my younger one is more adventurous. She will try more things, and she tends to eat a, a, a more varied diet. But, man, getting kids to eat healthy is one of the hardest things I've ever tried to do in my life. I hear you. I've got a, a similar one. who it's, it's grilled cheese or mac and cheese, one yeah. or the other. Yeah, that's, it. that's the staples. I don't know how to get something different in their bodies. It makes no sense. They don't eat anything mm-hmm. else. I made cauliflower and cheese once, and I got yelled at. <laughs> Sounds about right. And yeah. it's the worst is like I when I do make something, like I fully like cook a meal and I serve it to them, uh, and then like they'll taste it and like, oh yeah, it's pretty good. And then they get distracted and play for half an hour, and they don't eat anything. And then finally, you're like, are you gonna eat? And they, I don't like it. And then you just throw it away. It's mm-hmm. like, why? Mm-hmm. Like, what a what a nightmare this has been. The time I spent. And then arguing with you to get you to eat and then to just throw it away. This is just, oh, it's too much. It's too much. But. Uh, those darn, darn children. Right. Well, luckily, uh, there is a, a book that is now on our shelves that uh, so far has helped. There are a, a few uh, recipes that I've tried in Half the Sugar, All the Love that have worked out really well. One of them uh, I mentioned here in the interview that we're about to do with the author, Jennifer Tyler Lee. Um, the thing that, that I do love about this book, a couple things. One is it's very kid friendly. If you want to get your kids in the kitchen with you and cooking, she makes it very simple to do that. Uh, and, and also very low sugar in in everything that, uh, is listed in the book. And it's largely things that you already eat that you already buy at the store, but they're quick and simple ways for you to make them at home and uh, in a healthier way. So Zach and I had the chance to talk with the author, Jennifer Tyler Lee, uh, about the book and, and how it came together. So my new book, Half the Sugar, All the Love, I co-authored with Dr. Anisha Patel. 
who's on faculty at Stanford, and she and I were working together on a project to get kids to drink more water. It was a little video series where we showed how to make water flavorful with fruits and vegetables. And I said, beverages cover half of this problem, and the other half of the problem is in the foods that we eat. So let's write a cookbook. Let's make a resource available to parents so that you can enjoy all of your favorite foods but in a healthier way. One of the, my favorite parts about it is right up front the the myth busting that you guys do with these these five big myths about sugar. Uh, some of them I knew, some of them I did not. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so there are a lot of misconceptions when it comes to added sugar. So the first one I think that's really confusing for people is added sugar versus naturally occurring sugar. So added sugar, like granulated sugar, is sugar that's added to food to increase its sweetness. And in addition to granulated sugar, that's brown sugar, that's honey, maple syrup, date syrup. There are actually 60 different names for added sugar. And that's what we need to reduce. Naturally occurring sugar is different. So naturally occurring sugar will be inside that pear or apple or orange. And the difference with that is fiber. So fiber in that uh, pear will help slow absorption of the sugar in your body, making it easier for your body to process, and will also help you feel more full. So there's a really big difference. People get confused between added sugar and naturally occurring sugar and how to make sense of that. I actually do have a question about that. Uh, just I genuinely don't know. When I'm looking at a nutrition label on any you know, item at the store and it does say sugar, is there a way for me to be able to determine this is just something that happens naturally or did, did they add this in? How can I tell the difference? Yeah, so this is a really great point. There are new nutrition labels that are rolling out this month. You're going to start to see them where added sugar is on its own separate line. So that will be different from total sugar in the product, right, where well, you could definitely. get some of that naturally occurring sugar. Added sugar will be listed separately, and it will be listed in grams. So what you're going to do is take that number and divide by four to understand roughly how many teaspoons of added sugar are in that product per serving. Um, the problem is it's not listed on all products. So you'll see it on some, but some manufacturers aren't required to do it until next year. And then there's also product on the shelf that's a little bit older but not yet expired that may have older labels that haven't yet been updated. So when you're in that circumstance, there are a couple different ways that you can try and figure out how much added sugar is in there. One is to compare the unsweetened product to the sweetened product. So, for example, with milk, you can take a low-fat milk and compare it to a low-fat chocolate milk, and the difference in grams of sugar will tell you how much is added. And the remaining amount is coming from lactose, and that goes back to this idea that lactose is not what we're worried about. We're worried about those added sugars, the sugars that were added to the milk to make the chocolate milk that are creating the problem. Um, the other thing you can do is if those grams are not listed and it's really not clear and there's no comparison that you can do, look at the list of ingredients on the label. And they're sorted by weight, so the ones that are most used are higher up in that list. And there are 60 different names, more than 60 different names for added sugar. And there's actually a great figure in the book where we show all of those different names. And if any one of those show up on that label, you know there's added sugar inside. So what about alternative sugar or, or alternative sweeteners like stevia? Is, um, you know, in, in everything that I have um, looked at and read, you know, some if you're trying to ditch sugar, you know, that's, that's one of the things that they push on you is to use one of these alternate sweeteners like stevia. What, what's your take on those? Yeah, so that's another interesting area that gets confusing for people. So in the book, my co-author, Dr. Anisha Patel, and I recommend do not use sugar substitutes, either artificial ones or natural ones like stevia. And here's why. The new evidence-based science on this topic that's emerging is suggesting that those sugar substitutes may alter the gut bacteria in a way that's unfavorable. And also, 
stevia, for example, so it seems like it's natural, right? But stevia is 200 to 400 times sweeter than sugar. And what that does is when you consume it, it tells the sweet center in your brain that sugar is coming. But when your blood glucose level doesn't increase with it, your body gets a little confused and then may lead you to crave more sweet. So the research is still early and it's not definitive. Um, And given the lack of data, we recommend not using sugar substitutes, either the artificial ones or the natural ones. You're better off using fiber-rich fruits and vegetables to sweeten instead of added sugar or sugar substitutes. I've always wondered why Diet Coke just made me hungry. Maybe that's why. (laughs) Yeah, there was actually an interesting study that was done where they gave participants a, a soda that was sweetened with sugar and one sweetened with a sugar substitute and then looked at what they consumed afterwards. And the ones who had drank the soda with the um, sugar substitute ended up consuming more sweet treats later. So there's a lot that we don't yet know. And, but what we do know is that increasing consumption of fruits and vegetables is a good thing. So when you can sweeten with those fiber-rich fruits and vegetables, it's a healthier way to do it. I'm I'm curious. You, you sort of hinted at uh, something that I've always wrestled with with sugar and, and whether or not uh, or, or maybe how addictive it is. I mean, is it something that we should be concerned about on an addiction level? Yeah. So there's there's research on that, too, that's new and emerging. I mean, I think where we go to with added sugar, what we know is that people are consuming three times more added sugar than we should. So women are, con- are supposed to be limited to six teaspoons a day. We're consuming three times more than that. Kids are consuming their weight in added sugar, 64 pounds a year, three times more than their daily limit, which is also six teaspoons. And men are up there too, nearly three times, and their limit is nine teaspoons a day. So we're consuming a lot of added sugar, and it's partly – because it's in the beverages that we drink, but also it's hidden in foods that we don't even think are sweet, right? So things like savory foods and sauces, soups and dressings where you don't expect sugar to be can have a tremendous amount of added sugar. And it's just, it's causing this excess consumption that has been associated with cardiovascular disease and the conditions that lead to it, like type 2 diabetes, abnormal cholesterol levels. There are a whole series of problems. Yeah, the, the hidden factor is huge. The last couple of years, I've been on and off the keto diet. And when I first started doing it, you know, you really have to check labels and, and you know, learn your way into any, any routine like that. And I was just floored at how often there would just be loads of sugar and things that I thought, oh, th- this must be fine. This is a, a natural product. It's labeled as, as such. It's marketed as such. It must be, uh, you know, free of anything that would be toxic for me. And it, there, it is. It's just it's in everything. It's it's so amazing how hard it is to get away from putting that stuff in your body. Yeah, it's confusing. It, it, the packaging is confusing, and the li- the new label is going to help on that front. But, like, for example, with a salad dressing, right, if you're starting out the new year, trying to eat healthy, you've got salad, you're putting dressing on it, that salad, so I grabbed a creamy poppy seed dressing off of the grocery store shelf the other day, that jar had 18 teaspoons of added sugar oh inside. God. So instead, in half the sugar, all the love, I've got a creamy poppy seed dressing in there for you that's sweetened with pear instead. So you're cutting out the added sugar and still getting that delicious flavor. And that recipe takes three minutes to make in the blender. So you throw in the pear with a little bit of Dijon mustard and some white wine vinegar, a few other spices, and blend it up two minutes three minutes, and then you've got a dressing that you can use throughout the week. And it can also be used as a marinade or as a dip. So it's it's really paying dividends throughout your whole week. The other thing I love about your book is, uh, you know, you you say it's a family cookbook. It truly is. There is a a section in in each recipe for what the kids can do. I love that part because I'm always trying to think of ways to incorporate 
you know, the the act of running a house with my eight and four year old and cooking is, is, you know, should be a bigger part than it is. But this makes it so simple to just go, oh, the, OK, that part. Look, kids, this is the part that's yours. And you can point to the book. And yeah, and cooking with your kids is a great way to set them up for a lifetime of healthy habits. And when you cook with them, they're more likely to eat well. So there, there are so much goodness in there. And you can start really small. So with with each recipe, you noted, with each recipe, I've got tips, like what the kids can do to get involved. And they're simple tips, right? And it depends on the age of your child, how much they're going to be involved. The other thing they can do is start with pick up the book, find a recipe that they want to try, right? There are lots of pictures of recipes in there, and they all look beautiful and delicious. So let them choose what they want to try first. Um, another thing you can do, go to the grocery store and let them through the produce aisle and pick a new fruit that they maybe want to try. And then come back, you're going to find that fruit in the book and use it to sweeten one of their favorite treats in a healthier way. Like, it's a fun surprise. I love that. We Sometimes we go to, uh, I believe it's PCC that does this. They, they let kids take a free piece of fruit um, just because it's just so a way to you know entice you to go back. So that would be a really fun way to, to do that because they always just tend to go to the, the banana or the orange or whatever to eat right then. But I love that idea of, uh, of incorporating it into something bigger than, than what it is. That's, that's really yeah, cool. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun to try something new. And, you know, it's not only fresh produce either that I use. I, I wanted to make sure that all the recipes in the book used common ingredients that are probably already sitting in your pantry. So the canned vegetables is another thing that I like to use a lot. So I've got a canned sweet potato that I use to sweeten the double chocolate brownies. So you can, you can certainly use fresh sweet potato and cook it down, but if you don't have time and you've got that canned sweet potato in your pantry, use that with a little bit of almond butter and unsweetened cocoa powder. That whole recipe for the double chocolate brownie comes together in your food processor. It only takes a couple minutes, and it's less than half the sugar of a boxed brownie mix, and it's gluten-free. So there are a lot of reasons why it's just better for you. Yeah, and and I can vouch for the uh, for the no bake peanut butter energy bars. I I had some today, and we you know we have for the longest time bought various protein bars and different things to try and get the kids to eat more protein, get ourselves to eat more protein. Uh, but I, I you know these kill that. I mean these these are fantastic, and uh, I was really proud of my family because they made them, and they actually look like they do in the book. They did a great job. Yeah, good, well that's the other thing. It has <laughs> to be easy, and you have to be able to do it just like in the book. So it's uh, I, a fun story about that too. My daughter, who was 13 when I started writing this book, tested all the recipes in the book, and she would make them start to finish without my help. That's so I would awesome. sit there and watch her make those recipes just to see, is it easy enough for someone to be able to pull this off when I'm not there. And so if the 13-year-old can do it, you can do it, yeah, right? That's and those, those bars, those energy bars are such a great place to start because the packaged energy bar that that's, you know, I, I remastered all the things that are very common on the, I looked at grocery store data to understand what people were buying and then remastered those things. And those energy bars have as much added sugar as a candy bar when you buy them in the package. So making them at home with zero added sugar and sweetening them with dates is a much healthier way to enjoy that same kind of treat. All right, our thanks to our guest, Jennifer Tyler Lee, author of Half the Sugar, All the Love, uh, 100 easy low sugar recipes for every meal of the day. And they are easy. It is largely things that you probably already have in your cabinet or your pantry if you're lucky enough to have one. Um, so I recommend checking it out. And uh, we have a link to the book on our website, thefitmess.com. Um, and you're pretty uh, off the sugar already, right, Zach? Is that sort of part of your uh, routine right now? Yeah, for the most part. Um, I am doing everything I can to stay away from sugar. I, I just, for me, my body just reacts so much better when I don't have sugar in my body. Like it just, inflammation goes down and I feel better. Joints stop hurting and, uh, you know, I feel, I literally feel like five years younger when I'm not eating sugar. It's, it's pretty incredible. That's definitely something that I uh, remember from being really strict keto or really strict, you know, low carb or whatever was when you cut that stuff out, just the mental clarity, the, 
physical performance at all just is so much better. It's just it's so clear how bad sugar is for us, and for some reason it keeps getting dumped into absolutely everything we consume uh, from from basically anywhere. So it's really yeah. it's a really difficult thing to avoid. But it's sugar, right? I mean, there's. Um, I think what what people need to remember is that not everyone does well on like low carbohydrates, right? right? I mean, some people actually do really well eating a higher carbohydrate diet, but it's when people are, those carbohydrates are sugar, pure sugar. That's when there's issues. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Well, we're getting near the end of the show. Uh, I suppose it's challenge time. Do we, do we have something worked out? I thought we would have a challenge that was kind of loosely or even directly correlated with the interview that we just did. Okay. So, and this is going to be easy for me because I'm already doing it, but I think I want to challenge you and I'll do it with you, but I'm going to challenge you to not consume any processed sugar for a week. That should be doable because I think for the most part, that's what I do, but <clears throat> but it will it will make me focus on it and and uh, think a little bit more about it. I'm, and I'm glad you're making this challenge now because I literally just had like three nutter butters on the way downstairs, <laughs> <laughs> like 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 at 20 minutes ago. So so I'm I'm still trying to figure out what you're gonna eat. Like if you're vegan and no sugar, I mean you're just gonna have plates of ice for dinner, aren't Largely, you? Largely, yeah. No, it's there have been things mm-hmm. like uh, you you can make your own um, like meat alternatives. So instead of buying like the prepackaged, you know, uh, Morning Star, uh, you know, burger stuff, there's a, a way with tofu and and um, other vegetables that you can prepare them in a way that sort of replaces that. But it's whole foods it's not you know something processed and and uh junky and whatnot but every now and then right. you know I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab a beyond burger or an impossible burger or something and and have that but it's just it's really easy to default to those because they're quick they're easy you heat them up you eat them and that's that but it's uh it's not it's not a good regular thing to to put in your body but it's, uh it's almost as easy as cracking three eggs and right cooking those up they're delicious Jeez, i miss eggs eggs Yes, I miss eggs. They are. Well, well um, my my wife has been making me, um, like, in in um, cupcake tins. She's putting, like, a slice of ham mm-hmm. and then dropping the egg in and then sprinkling cheese on it and salt and pepper and just baking that. Boom. And it's, like, this little ham egg cup, yep. and it's wonderful. Nice. It's absolutely delicious. And But they just store in the fridge, and you just... I come home, I eat four of those, and boom, I'm done. I will. I'll have to report back. Cheryl bought this. Uh, there's this. There's this brand that makes uh, you know vegan mayo, vegan this, vegan that. They they make vegan eggs. It's it comes in a little container, and supposedly they can pre- be prepared just like eggs. I haven't tried it yet because honestly, I'm terrified. But I would be too. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm gonna cook some up and I'll report back uh, on whether or not that satisfies the uh, the itch to eat eggs because. Man, that's an easy uh, easy go to when you're when you're scrambling for protein. Ah, uh, uh-huh, scrambling. Yeah, see what I did there. <laughs> yeah, all I right. Do. I think that's it. Are we are we good? Did we miss anything? No, we're we're going to scrambled egg jokes. So I think we're done. I think we're done. I think that's a good point to to wrap it up. Uh, that's gonna do it for us for now. We will be back in a couple of weeks with a brand new episode. Um, lots of good stuff already in the pipeline for you this year. So please do subscribe on uh, Apple podcasts or wherever you get your, your podcasts and, uh, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the places. And, uh, please do reach out, uh, with, with whatever your struggles are, whatever you're doing to try and, uh, clean up your diet, your mental wellness, whatever your struggles are. We'd, we'd love to be a resource for you and, uh, and, and hear from you. So, uh, reach out to us uh, through the website, thefitmess.com, and we'll see you back there in a couple weeks. See you, everyone. Bye. We know this podcast is amazing and does not seem to lack anything, but we do need a legal disclaimer. Jeremy and Zach are not doctors. They do not play them on the Internet, and even if they did play them on the Internet, they would be really bad at it. Please consult your physician prior to implementing any changes that you heard on this podcast. The listener assumes that Jeremy and Zach do not know what they are talking about and that you will do your own research on the topics talked about on this podcast.